May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. The transfiguration of Jesus is a unique metamorphosis from human to divine light and then back to human. It's not seen anywhere else in the Bible. No other place in the Hebrew scriptures or Christian scriptures do we see anything like this, human to divine to human. After preaching for the first time about his suffering and death in Mark's gospel, Jesus climbs onto the high and holy mountain along with Peter, James, and John. And there on the mountaintop, before their very eyes, Jesus is changed. He becomes radiant. He is glorious in this transformation, embraced by God's pure light. His garments are whiter than white, right in front of them. And in the midst of his transfiguration, two other transformational figures are also transfigured. Elijah, the first and greatest prophet of Hebrew scriptures, and Moses, the great lawgiver and deliverer of Israel. So these three transfigured ones, Moses and Elijah and Jesus, stand in the presence of the three human ones, Peter, James, and John. The disciples are absolutely blown away, which only intensifies when the clouds over them come up with a voice that say, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Then it ends. There on the mountain, Peter and John and James are once alone again with their friend, their teacher, their rabbi. Everything seems to return to normal, yet in all honesty, nothing will ever be the same again. There will be a new normal from this point on that will change all of their lives forever. Behind them, are the memories of the beautiful days down in the valley, down by the seaside of Jesus teaching and preaching. And before them stands the valley of the shadow of death. And it will guide them into the valley in the days ahead. They will face religious confrontation and then go up another mount, the Mount of Calvary, where the hillside, on the hillside outside the gates of the metropolis Jerusalem, Christ will die. But not to lose this moment, here on the mountaintop, in a moment that time cannot reclaim by building little shrines for the moment, or, or perhaps uh, just simply making a monument to Jesus, they find that the man Jesus is shining like the Messiah Christ. The carpenter of Nazareth is now revealed as son of God, Christ of glory, and perhaps most important of all in this passage, the one to whom all should listen. And he commands them with the first words he speaks, even though he has been silent on the mountaintop, the first words he speaks on the way down to the valley is, don't tell anybody what just happened up there. Kind of a surprising first word. The question begs itself, does it take a moment like this for disciples to really listen to their teacher, to their rabbi? Do you and I really need transfiguration to take Jesus seriously? If that's what it takes, fine. But I've got to ask, do we need him to be turned into full and brilliant, bright, pure light, to listen to him, to follow his teachings, to see how he heals, and to follow his leading for us to lay down our lives for others? Listen to this. Throughout Epiphany, the Jesus of Nazareth, whom we have begun to know in Mark's gospel, for all his miraculous powers, is intensely human. We have seen him with anger. We have seen him feel pity. We have seen him hungry. 
We have seen him worn to the bone. But here in the transfiguration, he shows no emotion whatsoever. He takes no action. And from the mountain of glory, he says nothing. Rather, he appears in glory as almost a passive object of metamorphosis that reveals his inner nature to his innermost circle of disciples. Here is pure transcendence of a sort found nowhere else in the Bible, as I mentioned earlier. Listen to this. The holiness of the Messiah shines through the humanness of the man with a face that is so afire, it almost blinds Peter, James, and John. What are we to make of Elijah and Moses showing up, up there? In the transfiguration of Jesus, we are united with two expectations, and they are these. that th These are expectations that are held firmly and vibrantly, and to this day in Judaism as well. First, that God will fulfill the law that God has given, embodied by Moses. And second, that God's return and ultimate prophet is shown in the prophet Elijah. So on the mountain, the presence of the law and the presence of the prophets come together for the future hope. Elijah and Moses stand shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. It's almost as though they're presenting him and say, you get going, go on, you're on the right path, keep going, fulfill the law, fulfill the prophets. You go, boy, you're good. Now, they didn't say anything, so I made all of that up, but it's almost like that's happening, isn't it? I mean, what are they doing up there? They're there propelling him forward. And what are we to make of the disciples on the mountaintop? God reveals to them visions of past glory and a window into which they can glimpse future glory. But in spite of this glorious transformation of Jesus, we know that the future, like the past, is not the proper dwelling place of the church or of discipleship. We dwell in the present moment. It is in the present day that we come to know the definition and clarification of God's call for us. This day, this moment, this time defines us. And we learn from this story that when we glimpse glory, we cannot simply build three tiny houses to each one of them. Right? We can't just build a monument. We can't just build things when God is calling us to do things. Rather, God calls us like the disciples down from the mountaintop experiences to the valley of needs and to the present moment and the reality that we have that God beckons us into to shine for others, not to bottle stuff up for resale value. God transcends through Jesus all of this so that we might be agents of transformation for him and with him here and now. We are called from the mountaintop to the valley to spread love. This is well told in a story of Mother Teresa from years ago. On a visit to Melbourne, Mother Teresa tells the story in her own words this way. I paid a visit in Melbourne to an old man that no one knew existed. I saw that his room was in horrible condition, and I wanted to clean it up, but he stopped me. He said, I'm all right. I kept quiet, and finally he let me go ahead. In his room was a beautiful lamp covered with dust, and I asked him, why don't you light the lamp? He replied, for what? Nobody ever comes to see me and I don't need a lamp. Then I said to him, will you light the lamp if my sisters come to see you? And he said, yes, if I hear a human voice, I will light it. She continues, the other day, I received a message from the man in Melbourne. He said, tell my friend that the lamp she lit in my life burns constantly. 
if I hear a human voice, I will light the lamp. If I hear a human voice, I will light the lamp. How many times has God's light brilliantly broken forth in your life because someone has simply taken time to be God's transfigured, light-shining presence for you? How many of us have been a lamp lit for others in the lives that we have lived? Someone has been for us a light in the darkness and perhaps that has changed us and we've become a light for someone else. On this Valentine's Day, I want to lift up one of my most blessed memories of Valentine's Day, 2008. On that day, one of God's light beams entered this world and she has shined into my life and changed me. Her name is Grace Kristen Gleros. Grace was born at St. Anne's Hospital on February 14th to Lauren and Chris Gleros and her older brother Lincoln. Grace was born with spina bifida, a severe and serious medical condition that presents a lifetime of medical challenges. Shortly after she was born, I baptized Grace within an hour of her birth, not knowing if she would make it through her first day. Shortly after that, she was life flighted to Children's Hospital for her very first surgery. Since her birth 13 years ago, Grace Glaros has gone through 39 surgeries. Through it all, she has spread love. Chris posted this a number of years ago, May 4th, on Facebook, 2017. It was during a time when political leaders in Washington were chopping health care coverage for millions of Americans, and he was reflecting on his daughter and the fact that she wouldn't be here if it wasn't for good medical coverage. I share a part of his post related to Grace at the time she was nine. At a 20-week ultrasound in 2007, we learned that our baby would be born with spina bifida and, a fa and face a lifetime of enormous health challenges. After hearing this news, the first thing I could think of to do when I got home was to read my Bible. I randomly opened up the scriptures to see what would speak to me and my hand came to John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. He continues, I love singing Amazing Grace to my daughter at bedtime. Tonight, when I prayed with her and sang, I was thinking of elected officials while singing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And he concluded, Lord, I think they do not know what they do. Restore their sight for what is right. Those words spoken almost four years ago are as relevant this morning as they were May 4th, 2017. Amazing grace has inspired all of us for 13 years. From her wheelchair with lights on the front wheels, I'm looking down because I can see her coming down the center aisle as an acolyte. I can see her coming forward up the ramp to sing with the children's choir. I can see her smile and her joy as she comes to worship with us on Sunday mornings. Some of you have seen Grace sing and dance. You've seen her in the children's plays here at church as well. She also is a great piano player in which she takes weekly lessons. 
And I can't wait till she's in my confirmation class next year because she's one of the most eager learners of life and everything that I know. In speaking with Chris and Lauren this week, I listened to them talk about their daughter who needs 24 hours, seven day a week care. And yesterday had a Zoom baking birthday party with eight of her close friends as they were making cookies and brownies together, each in their own households. Now Lauren had dropped off all of the, the baking ingredients to every house and she said there were about 28 sticks of butter. So there was a lot of baking going on yesterday in Columbus. She said, grace is resilient. She is so loving and she reflects the goodness of people. She teaches us each day to never take any day for granted. Grace brings perspective to our lives as she needs 24-7 care. We take nothing for granted because she takes nothing for granted. Another good day is a gift, and none of it is promised to any one of us. She brings perspective to our lives to live this day with joy, to live life this day. And Lauren continued talking about the day that Grace was born. She said, you know, the day she was born, she came out screaming and crying, and she kicked her legs. And that made me feel really, really happy because we'd been told she may never move her legs. She had no idea. We had no idea that she would ever move at all. And there she was, my baby girl, screaming and kicking in front of me. It was a joyous day, as joyous a day as the glorious day that Lincoln was born. See, everything Grace does is harder for her than it is for you and me. But Grace ignores that. She ignores the challenge, and she powers through every day, her parents say. However, what I love and admire most about her is just that eternal spirit, that light that burns in her, that shines through her. She appreciates every little thing of life. For example, Chris told me the other day that she couldn't start, stop thinking. She woke up and she was thinking about the video of me baptizing her the day she was born. And she said to him, she said, that was the water from the River Jordan, just like Jesus said. And she said, how cool is that? Wow. How cool is that, Grace? You're the cool one. Grace is also very forgiving. She is thankful all the time for everything that everyone does for her. Her enduring through suffering and her true and amazing grace has brought her closer to God and has brought all of those around her closer to God as well, including me. Grace lives fully in the present. She shines God's light. Grace spreads love. All of us need to live in the glow and the glory of this present moment. All of us are called to shine God's light and love right now right where we are, and we need to embrace the transfiguring moments of life in which the mystery of God's light and love is present as though they're the most precious things that we have. See the glowing faces of a father carrying his newborn son around the hospital hallways, introducing that child to everyone in the path of his moving through the hallways, or a mother holding her daughter to her chest as she leaves court with her newly adopted child of joy. Or see a woman who's in her 80s shoveling the sidewalk for her elderly neighbors and dropping off cookies for her new next door neighbors. And see the closed eyes, the piercing smile, the moving head of a hopeful young artist listening to a symphony of sound in an orchestra hall. Or perhaps moving his fingers across the strings of his cello bringing beauty into the space of worship. And see another young artist with her eyes and mouth open, looking up, standing wide open with her head back against the wall, adoring an art piece hung in the museum next door. See a young girl 
facing a vast ocean in awe of the waves that echo and hit far too out to hurt her, but cause her to scamper and run away with glee to the safety of the sand dunes, and see a boy sliding home and laying in a cloud of baseball dirt with the winning run on a Saturday afternoon in July as teammates storm the plate and arms are flailing and feet are lifting in joy and everything is airborne. Do you see how we often are touched by experiences so incandescent, so alive, so mysterious, that they change us forever? That light is shining in ways that transfigure the human face, the human being with such beauty that it's almost beyond bearing. This is what God's love alive in the world looks like and feels like. And we glimpse in the face of God in a human voice, in a magnificent landscape, in a moment of pure joy. And we know that we have witnessed once again in a small but beautiful way, the transfiguration of our Christ, our God. So today, today, this moment, right now, remember that man from Melbourne. And if you hear a human voice, light your lamp. Today, Remember grace in Columbus, Ohio, and live each moment as though it's precious, because it is. Live each moment with love and with grace. Today, remember Jesus on the mountaintop of transfiguration. Take a moment with him there, and then come down and spread from the mountaintop of glory to the valley of need, all the love that you have been given. Spread it out. Spread love. Alleluia for the last time. Amen.